Okay, we're carrying on here with James. Uh, let me go back and uh, just kind of get us back to where we are uh, in the flow of thought in the, in the letter. In James chapter 4, verses 4 through 10, James issues a call to his readers to repent of divisiveness. They've been engaging in this divisiveness to repent of the cursing, the conflicts and quarrels, the envy and rivalry in which they've been engaged. So he issues this very strong call for them to repent of this fighting, quarreling, envy, uh, cursing, this kind of thing, this ill will, this, you know, the, this, uh, these, these uh, factions in the, in the group. He says you need to stop that. And he calls them to repent of that. And then he warns them that choosing the world over God will have dire consequences. This thing about being friends with the world. So he warns them that it will have dire consequences. And he assures them that God is able to provide grace sufficient to overcome the worldliness toward which the spirit within them is gravitating. And I went through that. That's kind of a complicated thing. But I think that's what he's saying is that the spirit that God calls to dwell within us tends toward it. It longs enviously in the sense it gravitates toward the world. But God has provided overcoming grace. See, to overcome that sinfulness and that worldly pull, God has grace sufficient to overcome that. And it's because of the availability of that overcoming grace and he says, he says, therefore it says, he, he refers to scripture, specifically Proverbs 3.34, especially the Septuagint translation of Proverbs 3.34. But he says, because of God, the availability of this overcoming grace, he says, that's why this, therefore scripture says that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And the connection is, is because God makes available this grace that is sufficient to overcome this gravitation toward the world, he then gives the condition for receiving that grace. He says, therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That is the condition for receiving God's overcoming grace. See, humility, brokenness before God, heartfelt repentance, see, that receives from God exaltation. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. You see, so that's that's the connection there. I see that he's calling them to repentance, and he tells them that that's the key to receiving the overcoming grace of God is you must be broken before God. You can't continue to to try to play God in the sense of, you know, uh, not acting like God, but, uh, you know, being somebody who's trying to take advantage of God, playing him in that sense. Like when you say, you're playing me. You see, you can't do that with God. So that's what I think he's talking about there. Then in chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, they're commanded as fruit of that repentance to cease speaking against one another. You know, as he talked about before, all these these problems they have, the cursing and this kind of thing, speaking against one another, which we don't tend to think is that big a deal. But it's very, very serious. And so he says, as fruit of that repentance, you have to stop, cease speaking against one another. That's contrary to the royal law which calls, calls on one to, to love one's neighbor as oneself, so you have to stop that. So he tells them that they have to do that as fruit of that repentance. And in chapter 4, verses 13 to 17, James, at least in my view, he's rebuking the few wealthy members among his, his audience, his readers. As I said, they were predominantly poor Jewish Christians, but at least it seems to me, my take on that section, is that there were at least a few wealthy members among them, these merchants, and he rebukes them because they labored under the arrogant delusion that they were guaranteed tomorrow. You know, this idea, no, no, we've got, we're going to go here, there, you know, here's how it's going to work out, and we're going to, you know, go here, there, make money, spend a year here, spend a year there, and there was no sense in their talk that your life is in the hands of God. Everything is in the hands of God. So this idea that he rebukes them for that, and he tells them in essence in verse 17 that because tomorrow is not under their control, at least that's what I think is being driven at there, and I I talked about that. I think he tells them in essence in verse 17 that because tomorrow is not under their control, it's wrong for them to put off till tomorrow the good that they know to do. You see, because you're not guaranteed tomorrow, you don't know that, so... 
uh, he appeals to a proverb, I think, that it's wrong for you, therefore, to put off until tomorrow the good that you know to do today. Just sit here, and, and I think specifically he's talking about helping the poor Christians. Here you are, one of the few wealthier merchant Christians here, and you're bopping around and making money and all this kind of thing. He says, it's wrong for you to put off till tomorrow doing the good that you know you should do today because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. You don't know that you'll be here tomorrow. You don't know anything about tomorrow. So I think that was the connection there, and I tried to make that case for you. Then in chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, he announces the, the fate of the wealthy unbelievers. See, I think in 13 to 17, he's rebuking the wealthy believers, the few wealthy believers there were for their their arrogant delusion that they're guaranteed tomorrow, and he's encouraging them to go ahead and do today the good they know to do, namely helping the poor brothers. But then in chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, he announces the fate of the wealthy unbelievers who are oppressing these poor Christians, Okay, who are after them, who are cheating them, stomping on them, abusing them, exploiting them. You have these wealthy people who are taking advantage of them. And doing that, and you see that in a number of places in the book. Now, their love of money, they're making an idol of it. He tells them very clearly, powerfully, explicitly in chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, that that's going to result in their condemnation. You see, they cannot sit here and, because of the love of money, ignore how God has called people to treat one another. And they cannot sit here and exploit and abuse people. Why? So they can keep their money. He says, the wages that you, you didn't pay the workers are crying out. Why didn't they pay them? Because they love money. They said, I don't care. I can get away with it. I'm rich enough, powerful enough. I can game the system. I can wind up cheating these people who have no power, and I will just walk all over them. Why? Because the only thing that matters to me is money. You see? And when we ended, I was, we looked at the text. You know, this is, this is a common thing, the idea. We looked at the warnings about uh, the danger of wealth, and there's, the New Testament says, all of the Bible says a lot about the danger of wealth. It's easy, it's a trap. You know, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's, it's an easy thing to fall into and to start worshiping that and caring more about that and making an idol of it. But when we ended, I looked at the text in 1 Timothy chapter 6, where Paul makes clear that it's not money itself that is evil, or having money, okay? We all have money. The thing that is dangerous is, is that it is easy to cross over into idolatry where you are willing to disobey God for the sake of money. And you see this everywhere. You see, you see it everywhere. So I just wanted to, that's where we ended. I, I made that point that, listen, money's not inherently evil. Money has been for, you know, a long, long time blessing to people and to the church. You are a steward of that money. And if you, you exercise that stewardship under the lordship of Jesus Christ, then it is a blessing. It, it is a means that he uses you to bless other people with that. That's why he says, you know, command them to be generous and willing to share. That's the key. And so these people in James 5 weren't there. All right, in, in chapter 5, verses 7 to 11, he encourages them to stand firm during their, the oppression by the rich that, he, that I've been talking about. That's their state. They're being oppressed by the rich, and he encourages them to stand firm. He says in chapter 5, verses 7 to 11, Be patient then, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Notice the farmer waits for the earth's precious crop, being patient over it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Strengthen your hearts, because the coming of the Lord has drawn near. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you not be judged. Look, the judge is standing at the doors. As an example, brothers, of patience amid suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Notice we consider blessed those who endured. You heard of Job's suffering and saw the purpose of the Lord, that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So here in, in chapter 5, verse 7 to 11... He's encouraging them to stand firm during this oppression by the rich that they're enduring. And I don't think you and I, at least not in my experience, you know, appreciate it, may get there for our society. But the notion of being oppressed and put down, tied to the faith, being abused and exploited because you're a poor person. And it's easy, see here, you know, to, to, 
get pulled from the faith for a lot of different reasons. And he's telling them, you hang tough. You remain faithful through all of this in view of their ultimate vindication in relation to the wealthy. These rich oppressors, in view of their ultimate vindication in terms of their rich oppressors, they must stand firm until that day, until the coming of the Lord. You have to hold on, you have to be firm, you have to maintain your faith as a farmer doesn't quit on his crop. You see, the farmer doesn't quit on his crop even though the harvest is yet future. It's it's out there, but he doesn't give up and quit on his crop, and as a farmer doesn't do that, so they must not quit on their faith even though its vindication or its reward is yet future. What's happening to them now? They're getting pummeled. They're getting stomped on, abused. They have nothing. And they're looking around going, we're the children of God. How can this be? What is going on? And he says, be patient. Hold. Just like that farmer who's doing all this, what's he looking for? He's looking for that day. You see, that future day. And so he tells them that they have to hold on. In fact, he says they should be strengthened to stand by the nearness of the judge. You see, the nearness of the judge, the nearness of the Lord's return is indicated in a number of places in the New Testament. And there have been in the history of the church, there have been scholars who claim that the New Testament writers, that they erred in in asserting that the Lord's return was near. But with many uh, scholars, I think they have misunderstood what the New Testament writers meant in saying that. You know, as I've said on many occasions... The Christ event, see, that with that event, with Christ's coming, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, with the Christ event, the end has drawn near. In that the necessary grounds or basis for the final eternal state has occurred. You see, the victory has been won by Christ. His atoning death purchased not only our reconciliation, but all of creation's. He's that cosmic. He's that big. It purchased not only our reconciliation, but all of creation's, which was cursed in connection with Adam's sin. He has done that. He has achieved that. And from the time of Christ's redemptive work, the final state has been, as we might put it, it's been a done deal. That might be how we would say it. It's It's been a done deal. All that remains is for the consequences of Christ's achievement to play out. You see, it has, been, it has been done, it has been achieved, and we're just waiting for the consequences of that achievement to play out fully. And so that's what's happened with Christ. And when the victory that's already been won by Christ, when that will be cashed out, see, when that victory will be fully expressed, when God will send Christ to consummate the kingdom that he inaugurated with his first coming, when he will bring history to a close, with the eternal state. You see, where there's no more suffering, crying, mourning, or pain. When that will happen, you see, when that will happen is a matter of God's unknown timing. That's a matter of God's unknown timing. Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, he warns or cautions his readers not to allow the apparent slowness of Christ's return to become a cause for doubting the certainty of his return. You see, that's the very thing they were looking at. And he says, listen, don't allow the the apparent slowness of his return to become a cause for doubting his return. He tells them that God operates in his own dimension of time. You see, he operates in his own dimension of time. With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. See, so he cannot be judged by human perceptions of slowness. That's what Peter says. We're sitting there going, wait, what do you He says, no. You know, you can't do that. You see? God operates in his own dimension of time. Well, see, since Christ's achievement, creation has been on the verge, the brink of the end. I've shown you this diagram many times, this poorly drawn diagram. It's taken from a 19th century pastor, a guy named J.H. Newman. It's frequently cited in commentaries. And it, it depicts the idea, at least it was helpful to me to see it. And so I've shown it to you a number of times. See, as long as this reality, history as we know it, as long as this reality continues, it does so on the brink of Christ's return and the consummation of all things. However long God in his purposes 
extends the time since Christ, Christ's coming is ever at the door. That's the idea, you see. That's all over the New Testament. He's ever at the door, however long he extends his time. I've used this mundane analogy of if all the defenders in a football player block so hard they're knocked unconscious, okay? They get, I mean, you talk about some serious hitting. They're all completely knocked out. They're knocked so hard, hit so hard they're rendered unconscious. Well, when the last defender is knocked out, the touchdown's already secured at that point. All the defenders are gone. The only question is how long will the runner take to cross the goal line? You see, he could stroll, he could hang out, or he could sprint. You see, but it's a fait accompli. You see, it's a fait accompli. It's already done. There's just a question of the timing. Or you think of a will that calls for the executor to bestow on the heirs an inheritance at whatever time the executor chooses. You know, you could see a will like that. Or the testator, the one making the will, says, I want to give, you know, X, Y, and Z, these things. But uh, it's up to your discretion. You give it to them, uh, you know, at whatever time you choose. Well, once the testator dies, the inheritance draws near in a sense that it it now may come at any time. Very quickly, you see. Because the, the, the key, the basis of it has now occurred with the testator's death, the necess- what's necessary for the exercise of the executor's discretion, that has occurred. And so from the testator's death on, the heirs live on the brink of the inheritance without knowing when it actually would arrive. So these are ideas that I'm trying to get you to see something about this. This is this concept of the nearness. Here's how Douglas Moo puts it. I use this many times because I love it, but it's actually from his commentary on James. So it comes from his discussion of this text. But Moo, as I've told you before, he's got a funny last name, but uh, he's a well-known New Testament scholar. He says, with the death and resurrection of Jesus and pouring out of the Spirit... The last days have been inaugurated. This final age of salvation will find its climax in the return of Christ in glory. But, and here's the crucial point, the length of the age is unknown. Not even Jesus knew how long the last days would last. Mark 13, 32. What this means is that the return of Christ as the next event in the salvation historical timetable is from the time of the early church to our own day near or imminent every generation of christians of every generation of christians lives or should live with the consciousness that the parousia the return the coming of christ could occur at any time and that one needs to make decisions and choose values based on that realization so it was as true in james's day as it is in ours we need to be patient and stand firm because the lord's coming is near and that's what I think he's telling them. Listen, you know, he wants them to be strengthened by that fact. That the Lord, that life and existence and all these things occur on the brink of the Lord's return. So he says, listen, you're getting the hammer. I know that. You're suffering. You're being exploited. You're being abused. You're poor. You're suffering. I know that. But you don't let any of that pull you from your faith. You see, because say, look, this doesn't look like it's paying off. This doesn't look like it's really the smart move. They're on top. I'm on the bottom. That's why when you you hear people today who say, no, no, becoming a Christian and you see your world, you just get transported into this bubble and you get all this money and protection. And you, I say, well, what about these people? And many other people. It's just... (laughs) I don't know what to say about that. Yet, I, you turn on television, these people got a, a room full of thousands of people. And I just said, I scratch my head and say, well, what's the deal with this? But, uh, you know, that's how life is. But, uh, uh, so, I mean, you see what he's telling me, and I think it's important. He says, you have to be firm. You do not let the pressures and the struggles, whatever they are, pull you from your faith. Now, in the interim, you see, as they wait in the midst of these trials... They must not turn on one another. To do so, see, that would be to risk condemnation. As she says, strengthen your hearts because of the coming of the Lord is drawn near. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you not be judged. Well, you see, I think that pressure and those kinds of difficulties and hardship 
it's easy to start breaking apart. It's easy to start carping and complaining and biting and all this kind of stuff. When I'm, things, when, you know, when I'm, when I'm in the catbird seat, it's easier for me to be magnanimous. When I'm really suffering and struggling, it's easier for me to sit here and say, bah, 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 you see, and start to, to bicker and fight and do this kind of thing. And he tells them, I know you're suffering, I know you're struggling and all that, but listen, the Lord's, it's at the door. You need to be patient like the farmer you hang on. Despite all the suffering in this world, you don't let anything pull your faith. And as you do that, do not grumble against one another. As I said before, you know, we just don't take these kinds of things as seriously as other things. What does he tell him? He says, do not grumble against one another so that you not be judged. And we think like grumbling against one another, that's just part of life. That's just Christian living. <laughs> You know, I just sit here and have the elders for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now the preacher for dessert. But, you know, he said, don't grumble. And then we, you know, create, you know, storms, you know, a little in in the group, you know, over here and, you know, pockets of griping and all this kind of stuff. What's that? (laughs) You see, he says, he said about this grumbling. He tells them not to do that, and you see that they've had a problem with that. The prophets serve as good illustrations, you see, of those who hung tough in the midst of trials. What did the prophets do? The prophets, the real prophets of God, when people are pushing them, throwing them in cisterns, doing all this kind of stuff, sawing them in half, what are they doing? Are they saying, oh, well, stop, wait. I didn't know there was going to be a price to this God stuff. In that case, forget everything I said and forget this God. I'm with you. Did they ever do that? Of course not. They're an example of those who hung tough during all kinds of persecution, difficulties, trials, hardships. See, those who endured, and what what's happens to those who endured? These prophets who hung tough during hardships, persecution, suffering, difficulty, all kinds of things trying to push them off their faith. Those who hung tough, what do we think? Well, we think, you know, those people, they're considered blessed. Nobody looks back on a prophet and says, boy, that prophet, he really missed the boat. He should have given up and jettisoned God instead of sitting in that mud. Boy, that was crazy on him to make that choice. Who says that? Nobody says that. As we look back at the prophets, we say, sweet. That's right. That's faith. That's how to live. And so he points to them and he says, you see, just like the prophets, you see, those who endured, they're considered blessed. You see, in other words, the wisdom of their choice in remaining faithful in the face of hardship, persecution, trial, suffering, difficulty, the wisdom of their choice in remaining faithful in spite of that is universally recognized. We all recognize, we say, look, that's right. No, they did right. That was the way to go. And so he points to them and says, look, as with Job, see, those who are faithful in suffering ultimately receive the Lord's compassion and mercy. He said, you heard of Job's suffering. Now, you know Job, right? I mean, Job, did Job suffer? Ooh. That's another thing. I look at people, I said, do you not read Job? You know, you know no, 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 I'm in this magic bubble. If I'm, if I'm a Christian, that's what God's doing. He's trying to, you know, take care of me in this world so that I have, you know, a nice car and a big house and all that kind of stuff. I said, well, you know, people suffer, <laughs> right? And here's Job scraping boils off him. And so they sit there and say, look, you heard of Job suffering and saw the purpose of the Lord, that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And the whole point is, is listen, you have to be faithful while you're getting pressure. Faithful under pressure. You cannot allow the pressure to cause you to crack and to start grumbling and fighting and throwing off God. You have to hold and say, listen, Lord, I don't understand why you're allowing this to happen to me, but the one thing I do know is that you love me to death. You see? I know that. I will not allow this circumstance, the horror of what I see, to pull me off what I know. I won't let it happen. And that's what he's telling them, see? Because they're really struggling and suffering. Then he goes on, he says in in chapter 5, verse 12, he says, Above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, But let your yes be yes and your no, no, so that you not fall under condemnation. See, swearing, of course, it doesn't mean dirty language. I mean, dirty language is sinful. 
you see. But he's not talking about there. Swearing is an appeal to God or to some other sacred object as a guarantee uh, of the truth of what we say. You see, that's what it is. It's like, no, 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 no. Listen, I'm going to swear that what I'm telling you is true. You see, that's what it is. It's that kind of appeal, see. Perhaps these poor Christians, you think, well, he doesn't explain why this happens, but perhaps these poor Christians were tempted, you see, especially tempted to swear to bolster their credibility in the disputes they're having with the more powerful, ungodly oppressors. They hold all the cards. They're coming in with this, with this justice system that they have, you know, their thumb on the scale. And maybe they felt pressure to come in and say, no, no, look, you know, I'm swearing that this is right, and I swear that this is right, and, and you know, either against to defend themselves against lies or to defend themselves when they're being cheated. He doesn't say that, but that would fit the context to me of that this was a particular problem that deserved mention in this letter. Now, James, in accordance with Jesus' instructions in Matthew chapter 5, verse 34 to 37, he forbids them from swearing. Now, it could be that Jesus simply wanted to keep Christians from the oath game. Maybe that's why he forbid this. You know, this game of saying, listen, I swear by, uh, you know, the left eyebrow of the camel. Well, that's not binding. But you don't know that. I swear by this, and I swear by that, and I swear by this part. Oh, got you. You see, you thought that was binding because I swore. But no, no, those kinds of oaths aren't binding, even though they sound just like the other ones. You see, maybe he, maybe he just said, look, I don't, I don't want you to get engaged in, involved in the oath game, see, which was just a popular method of deceiving the unaware. And you see, the idea is that since every word of theirs was to be honest and binding, there's no place for them to offer sworn speech as uniquely or distinctively truthful. Where is there room for that? If everything I say is to be the truth, then where is the room for saying, yeah, 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 I, I, I tell the truth, but here, I'm really telling the truth now. You can really believe I'm telling the truth now because I appealed to God or to some sacred thing. Here's how Luke Timothy Johnson puts it in his commentary. He says, if speech is meant to be a primary symbol of the self, if it is from, one's, if it is from the heart's overflow that the tongue is meant to speak, then the invocation of a special realm, whether heaven or earth or power, the name of the Lord, to buttress one's own speech becomes paradoxically an admission that one's own speech is untrustworthy without such warrant. Do you see, if, if I'm saying that, if I'm saying, no, in order for you to really trust me and really believe me, I'm going to appeal to this thing. Otherwise, you know, I can understand your skepticism. You see, otherwise I can get it. But you're not when I'm appealing to this. You see, then he goes on and he says, the more towering the oath, the more impressive the power invoked to support my own statement, the more suspect my innate truthfulness appears. You see, so this is the idea, what I think is behind it. The Jewish historian Josephus, he reports of a, you know, one of the Jewish sects, S-E-C-T-S, sects. One of those sects was the Essenes. And Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, says of the Essenes, who held a similar view, he says, every statement of theirs is sure than an oath, and with them swearing is avoided, for they think it worse than perjury. For they say that he who is not trustworthy, except when he appeals to God, is already under condemnation. And the idea you see is toward just a complete truthfulness as a Christian. So that when you and I speak as Christians, we speak the truth. And you can trust what I tell you. Like I was thinking, you know, if I said something to Meg, and Meg turned around to me and said, do you swear that's true? I'd about fall over. <laughs> Why? Because I would hope she would know that when I tell her something, yeah, I'm telling you the truth. But if she said, oh, are you going to swear about it? You see, that's the idea. So the, the essence of it is, is that we are to be so consistently truthful across the board. No exceptions for business and all that kind of stuff. Exceptionally, all, you know, just... Without exception, we are truthful people. So then we say something to you, you can take it to the bank. Now this prohibition, I think it's limited to voluntary oaths. I think it's limited to voluntary oaths. See, in an official oath, see, one that responsible authorities require you to take, 
the one swearing is not offering the testimony is more reliable. He's not doing that. He's simply complying with someone else's requirement for truthfulness. So if I sit here and I go into a court, I wouldn't have a problem saying, do you solemnly swear? I'm like, yeah, all right. If you need that, if you want that. But I tell the truth anyway. Okay, so I think this, I think that's a way of understanding that. But most places now, by the way, do a little, uh, at least they used to. They'd always, like in Florida, they'd always say, do you swear or affirm? And they thought that that saying, do you affirm, uh, that that would let out somebody who had a conscientious objection to that. But uh, either way, I think it relates to voluntary oath. Now, if Paul's witness formula, you might be thinking, well, I seem to recall Paul, you know, saying appealing to these things is with God as my witness kind of thing. For instance, in 2 Corinthians 1.23, Galatians 1.20, well, if that qualifies as swearing, and I can see a good argument that it does, if that qualifies as swearing, it may be, you see, that, that love requires voluntary oaths to be given when skepticism makes them necessary to benefit other people. You, you say, well, no, I think these aren't, don't qualify as oaths, these witness formulas that Paul used. Okay, well, if you think they don't qualify as oaths, fine. If, the, if they do qualify as oaths, then how would one understand them in the context of the prohibition against oaths? And what I'm suggesting to you is there may be a way of doing that. It may be that they do qualify as oaths, but there's a way of distinguishing them from what is intended to be prohibited here. And that would be that, look, if, if love requires this oath to be given when skepticism makes them necessary to benefit other people. You see God swearing, in fact, in the Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17. The idea I'm driving at here, you see, there's a difference in my swearing to you that my elixir is an antidote to snake bites, so you'll buy my product. And in my swearing to you that my elixir is an antidote to snake bites, so you'll take it before you die. There's a difference there. And whether that difference is relevant to what's going on here, there is a distinction there that I think, and if that's the case, you see, then I can see how Paul could say, you know, because of your own skepticism has created a barrier to my blessing you, I will do that. Okay? And I just throw that out for you to think about. Now he comes to uh, 5, 13 to 18. He says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him summon the elders of the church and let them pray over him, having anointed him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is ill, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he may have committed sins, it will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is, is very powerful. I almost said powerful and effective out of the NIV. The prayer of the righteous man is very powerful and it's working. Elijah was a man with the same nature as us and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its crop. And here we see James. He talks about here this instruction on suffering and cheer and illness, he says, they're to pray in suffering during all sorts of afflictions and trials. You know, pray in suffering during all these afflictions and trials. And you see suffering, he talks about in verse 10. You see, so here they are in this suffering difficulty. He tells them that they're to pray. And they should pray for wisdom. We saw in chapter 1, verse 5. Pray for wisdom. See that you not be pulled off in this so that you can see the right road to take uh, as oppression and difficulty and hardship begin to blur where is the right path it becomes easy to rationalize taking the wrong path when things are difficult you see it really looks like the way out of this jam is for me to lie about this or to fake this or to do this or that you see and wisdom will allow one see to see correctly so in chapter 1 verse 5 he said that they had to pray about that they're to pray for wisdom and for strength to endure the hardship faithfully not necessarily for deliverance from it you see, that we are to pray during suffering, not necessarily for deliverance, but certainly for strength to endure it and to live faithfully through it, because we are pressured. And that's the whole thing he's talking about, is that, listen, you need to stand in the face of hardship and pressure and difficulty. So he says, they're to pray in their suffering during all sorts of afflictions 
and trials, which they're enduring, you need to be praying. You need to be praying. And they're to sing praise to God when they're cheerful. See, when they're comforted and happy in heart. See, which isn't dependent on their circumstances, by the way. Doesn't depend on their outward circumstances. It's easy for us to forget God when we're in good spirits. You know, that's easy. You know, when he told him, he says, I'm going to bring you into the promised land. You're going to go and rolling in there and, you know, stuff's going to be happening. You're going to be rich and having all kinds of stuff and you're going to forget me. You're going to say, by my own power, I got all these things. And it's simply easy to forget the Lord when things are going great for us, when we're in good spirits. But we have to remember that he's the giver of our contentment. You see, he is the giver of our contentment. And he says, you know, singing praise, this is, this is closely related to prayer. In fact, it can be seen as a form of prayer. This idea of singing praise is just prayer done that way. And I think you can see that in a number of uh, uh, psalms. In chapter 5, verse 14, it almost certainly means, is anyone among you sick? Okay, meaning physically ill rather than spiritually weak. Okay, there, there's been an awful lot of discussion about this section in here. But it almost certainly means physically ill rather than spiritually weak. And this is recognized by virtually all the modern English translations. And the reason it seems that way is that this word, it can be used to refer to a spiritual weakness. But when it does, when, that, when that's the case, the meaning's made clear by some kind of qualifier or something in the context. In other words, the default alone is going to be referring to sickness. Now, it can refer to a spiritual sickness or weakness, but when it does that, you have some kind of pointer that we're, you know, it's being used that way. And in the Gospels, which include the accounts that have exercised the greatest influence on James' of vocabulary and James' theology, it always denotes physical illness. So here we have James who seems steeped in the Gospels, and in the Gospels, it always, it always means a physical illness kind of illness and the only other new testament reference to the practice of anointing with oil in mark chapter 6 verse 13 it's a relation to physical healing so it seems like he's talking about those of you who are sick those of you who are suffering physically who are physically ill and the person is so sick it looks like he's just completely laid out you see just completely flat out and this is suggested by the fact that he is to summon the elders rather than going to them. And presumably that's because he can't go to them. He just laid out. And also it seems indicated by the fact that they are to pray over him rather than around him. And that gives this indication of something that he's there and they're over him like that. So it looks like here's this person, he's completely laid out and the elders of the church. He's to summon the elders of the church who are of course the leaders of the congregation who are spiritually mature Christians. That's what elders are. They're the leaders who are spiritually mature Christians. They're described in the New Testament in a number of different ways, words. You know, elder, sometimes they'll translate it, uh, you know, this word uh, presbyteros is elder. Rarely they're called presbyter. Uh, poimen is shepherd or pastor, episkopos, overseer, or bishop. You have these different Greek words for the same office, the same role of these spiritually mature men who have the shepherding, overseeing responsibility of a flock of Christians, and their function, their role is to be a spiritual blessing to the flock that's in their charge. You see, that's what they're about, is the spiritual welfare of this particular flock. Doesn't mean that you and I are off the hook for our own spiritual life. Of course not. It means they have a God-given responsibility that they are to be a blessing to us in that way, and it's a big responsibility. Okay, it's a big responsibility, and that's why sometimes I go off on the way that we treat elders, uh, not necessarily here. I'm just talking about churches in general, you know, it, it's, it's easy to have this attitude about them as though they're in here, you know, they're certainly not in it for the money, <laughs> you know, and we don't under, I think we underestimate uh, the difficulty, and we only see one side of things sometimes, and unless you've been in the position you know, you just need to say, listen, I trust that the guys are doing what they think is right and they're wrestling and struggling and they're trying, even if from my perspective, if I was in their shoes, I'd do something different. You see, well, you're not in their shoes, <laughs> you see? And so that's how, and anyway, they, 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 that's who elders are and you know that. Well, olive oil, this olive oil is to be applied by the elders in conjunction with their praying 
And the oil in this case, it might serve as a sign or symbol that the sick person is being set apart for God's special attention or care. Maybe that's its function. It's simply this symbol that the sick person over whom the elders are praying is being set apart for God's special attention in prayer. But I know at least one person who thinks that it's, a, it's an expression of faith that the sick person will get well. In other words, his idea is that, no, what's going on here is that anointing with oil was a daily part of normal life. And it was only suspended like in times of distress and mourning and that kind of thing. So that when you're anointing them, you're basically saying God's going to heal the person and get him back into normal life. So the equivalent would be like, you know, we might give him a shave kind of thing. You see, uh, I don't know. Uh, but you, you have this idea with the oil, that was the second bell, right? So there you have it. Uh, two weeks, Lord willing, we'll finish this. Uh, not that much to do, we'll finish that. I'll go back and uh, maybe highlight some things. And then the week after that, uh, I'll just have to surprise you. Thanks for coming.